Welcome. Uh, my name is John Bell. For those of you who are just arriving, welcome to this Cold World Forum. Uh, we've been here for about three days already. Um, you could have gone to uh, creating talent, uh, exponential fundraising, uh, something about social impact, but you came to something called Begin Within. I'd like you to turn to your neighbor, someone you don't know, and just introduce yourself, your organization, and why you chose to come to something called Begin Within. Okay? Just for a couple of moments each. Well, we're a small enough group, I think the conference is getting going, that we could each introduce ourselves and say in less than a minute your name, your organization, and why you did come. Would you start, please? My name is uh, Najla Al-Bajda. My organization is Khayarat, which is options in Arabic, and I provide career guidance to students in the UAE. And I think the reason I came is because I'm, I guess, at a, in a tragic transformation point in my own career. I've recently left a job and I'm starting this uh, social enterprise. So for me, I, I realized that the, I need to first believe in myself and work in myself before I can really see this uh, organization come to fruition. Good, thank you. Uh, my name is Haitha. I'm from Bahraini. I'm a diplomat in the embassy in London. Um, I came here because I, I'm always really stressed out. <laughs> <laughs> Enough said. Enough said. Thank you. I'm Becca. I'm with the Skoll Foundation. Um, and I'm here because it's been a very exciting first couple of days, a very hectic first couple of days. Um, and so I just wanted to sort of refocus and come back together and really prepare for the awesomeness that is going to be the rest of the School World Forum. Good, thank you. Fred Hobson. I'm the founder of 1617 Foundations with the aim of empower people. Based on a vision I saw long ago, 30 years ago or so. But the chaos in the world is a reflection disorder in our minds and us, the environment. So that came so it came to me that if we help to reorder our environment, it will be reflected in the outer world. Okay, you could teach this course. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right. I'm Marcella Manovez and um, I think that everything starts from within. I mean, everything has to start here in order to be able to transform. And I have been in that journey, I guess, I have been working in human rights and legal rights in business for many years. And I work in social impact, so I want to, not only for me, but to help others. Can we start from within? Good, thank you. Hello, I'm uh, Ben Hicks from The Guardian, newspaper in London, uh, and why am I here? Uh, I have a, a personal interest in organizational psychotherapy. <laughs> if you speak, if you speak loud enough, I'm not sure. <laughs> 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 I got a microphone. I'm very important. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I agree with what we've said just about how um, recently I've been very interested in um, how the Guardian, the Guardian has um, an editorial team at the centre of it, and it has a commercial team, which is sometimes at odds with the editorial, as you can imagine, because you're bringing money to an organisation which has to hold mm -hmm. private organisations to account mm -hmm. is a very complex thing, and the, those relationships can be very tense. Mm -hmm. And I work in a sort of non-profit bit in the middle, and so I live my life with either this side angry or this side angry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, Okay, thank you. <laughs> We're just introducing ourselves. In, in less than a minute, your name, your uh, organization, and why you came to this particular workshop. Uh, my name is Deanna Zant. I have an agency in New York called Lux Digital. We're working with the School World Forum on their digital outreach. I will be live tweeting and uh, blogging highlights from uh, throughout the forum. Um, so if there's anything you don't want said to 500,000 people, just let me know. Okay, thank you. And uh, I came here because 
we were assigning sessions to each of the staff, and I said, no, no, I'm the secret hippie. Uh, I'm coming to this one. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Sai, and I'm from uh, Myanmar, and I'm with a organization called Proximity Designs, and we uh, work with rural farmers to increase their income. And the reason I'm here is I, uh, as a operation director in our organization, I've run um, a series of leadership program for our team leaders in, in the organization, and uh, um, the title of my program is called uh, in in and out leadership. So if you are in uh, Southern California, you know, me, <laughs> it's not a burger chain, but for me, you know, <laughs> um, inside, you know, what you really, uh, who you really are, and mm -hmm. your know, authenticity, and that's also shaped by the external environment. And this, um, I'm planning on doing another round of uh, leadership program, and I hope to gain some Good. insight from this. Welcome, yeah. Come on up front, unless you're just. Plenty of room where you're going to be an intimate group. <laughs> so my name's Mike, and I run a consulting firm called Junction that does work with a lot of social entrepreneurs around the world. We have offices in Vancouver and London and Delhi, so very different contexts. But in each of those contexts, we see social entrepreneurs that burn themselves out all too frequently, that mm -hmm. sacrifice themselves on the altar of the work that they're doing. Right. Uh, and so I'm increasingly interested in convening social entrepreneurs and teaching them self-care and self-leadership right. as an essential foundational piece for being successful entrepreneurs. Great, thank you. <laughs> My name is Ifat. Uh, I'm, I teach social entrepreneurship at the uh, Reconati Business School in Tel Aviv, Israel. Uh, and we are, uh, together with uh, some partners, we're trying to build a center for uh, social impact at the university and trying to convince business school to do something that relates to social entrepreneurship is social entrepreneurship by itself because we have to struggle with so many obstacles and challenges uh, consciously and non-consciously. And uh, I just decided that instead of finding all those seminars about professional tools like you know finance <laughs> and fundraising and uh, <laughs> maybe I'll sit down and <laughs> okay. just find out yeah. Good, thank you. What I'm looking for. Good afternoon. My name is Johannes Sommerfeld. I work for a United Nations based special program for research and training in tropical diseases. We are setting up uh, a, a social enterprise innovation <coughs> program. We want to do rigid case study research and we want to support social enterprise innovation throughout the uh, program that I'm working for in Geneva and I'm interested in leadership with respect to that activity. Okay, thank you. Okay. My name is Kolatulain Bakhtiari and I'm from <coughs> My name is Kolatulain Bakhtiari from Pakistan and I work with the young people. Uh, we have set up an institution, the Institute for Development Studies and Practices where the uh, young men and women come from uh, all over. And most of the time, uh, because of the situation that they are in Pakistan, uh, you find a lot of pain in them. In them. But uh, because I'm teaching in it also, and I, and I work with them very closely, therefore I myself also need all the time to be grounded again and again myself to be strengthened enough to relate to them effectively <coughs> and meaningfully. Good, thank you. Hello, I'm Jess Bennett. Um, we have a family foundation that deals with poverty alleviation uh, in Asia. Um, I think I'm a victim of distraction and overwork and it's finding a balance. I think everyone struggles with it. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think that if you can, you're more productive actually than you would be otherwise. Even if you work 24-7, you're better not. <laughs> mm -hmm. My name is Jamal Alexander, I'm president of the National Alumni Council with Youth Build and um, a delegate with school as far as emerging young leaders. And I'm actually here to get a different perspective in a way where um, I'm a part, I'm a product of the program, Youth Build, and I admire Ms. D and Ms. D JB, and, and I'm still trying to figure out how have they been doing it for so long. So <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to get some insights and a different approach. So. And I'm Rianne, I'm working for the school um, speaker team this year, and it's my first year on the team. I go to the Oxford School of Drama, but I thought I'd get involved in the school because it's a very good organisation, you meet so many different people, and it's different life as well. My name, 
<coughs> My name's Dorothy Stoneman. I'm here because I'm a presenter and because I have the key to avoiding burnout and managing stress. Mm -hmm. And so I'm here to share that with you. Uh, someone came in? Yes, yeah. Hi, my name's Amanda Stevens. I'm a mayor in um, a city in Australia called Port Phillip. It's the second city in Melbourne. You said a mayor? Uh, yeah, a mayor. Uh -huh. um, so, the, you know, the local leader of the yes. city. Great. Um, I'm interested in leadership and it's my first time at Skoll, so I'm interested to hear and learn. Good. Welcome. Thank you. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, this quote is important for all of us, I think. It's one of my touchstone touch, touch stones for two reasons. One, on the macro level, if you think of all the big social political revolutions that have happened in my lifetime, China, Russia, well, Russia is not my lifetime, but China, um, South Africa, Nicaragua, Cuba, civil rights movement in the South and the United States, maybe the Arab Spring now, there was tremendous upheaval, change of leadership, the oppressed people become the new leaders, and what happens? It goes south. They carry into their new roles, what? All of that old stuff they internalize. So the people who were oppressed at one point, damaged, become the rulers, and they in turn pass that back on down, and they recreate a tyranny. Usually a little better than the last one, a little more humane, but still, fairly um, harsh. And we know that this is just the macro level of what happens. A person who abuses, a male who abuses his wife or children, we know that in, when they were young people, they were abused. So we have not figured out as a human species how to make big historical transformations and have done the healing along the way. So we have to figure out how to do social healing and personal healing in order for the things to stick. The lasting part, the lasting part. How do these new ways last? The second reason is because on a personal level, each of us in this room and all the people we're gonna meet this week, this week are working on a social problem we wish did not exist, right? <laughs> we're trying to work our way out of a job, really. And we work very, very hard. I mean, we love the earth, we love its peoples, we love its, the creatures, we love the beauties of the earth. We work hard enough, we care enough to try to eliminate the, the worst of suffering, if not reduce it somewhat. And we want to bring about greater peace, justice, all the good things that we know in our hearts are just what everybody wants, right? And what we do is extremely hard. We work through funding, trying to get the right people, cutbacks, attacks sometimes, uh, and we're not done yet. And we get up every morning trying to like break it through. So I want to thank you very much for what you're doing, and I'd like you just to turn to your neighbor and thank them for what they're doing in the world, whatever, whatever they're doing. Just thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much for what you're doing. Thank you for Thank what you're you. doing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're Thank doing. Thank you, Karatalan. Right? <laughs> now, <laughs> we don't do it for, for, for the thanks. We don't do it for the thanks or the glory or the money or the uh, awards, but look how much just being thanked. What, what, yes, because we actually know that we're, you know, we, we are busting our behinds every day with courage and creativity and you know, persistence. Um, and you can't be half awake in this world, look around and not have a broken heart. You just can't. At the cruelty and suffering and unnecessary stupidity and insanity that, that seems to run most of the world. It's like, it's upside down, isn't it? And if we, you know, if our hearts are torn apart just reading the newspaper, uh, let alone working with the people in many of our organizations we're working with on the ground and really understanding the reality of their lives and the suffering, the resilience, yes, and the, and the persistence, yes, but the deep suffering that they carry. You cannot but 
accumulate a lot of inside heartbreak. So what do we do with that? If we don't deal with it, it's sort of like what a couple of you mentioned, like it starts to burn out. We get compassion fatigue, whatever those terms are. You say, I just can't do this anymore. I can't do it anymore. You know? So that's one reason why we have to find ways of renewing ourselves. The other thing is that no matter what's happening in the world, we bring our own stuff to whatever work we're working on, right? Our own insecurity, our fears, our, oh, I'm not good enough, uh, I, I can't do enough, I haven't done enough, they don't like me, you know, whatever version that we have. And that, as we all know, makes us less effective. We can't think as clearly when we're preoccupied with all of that internal stuff. And it tends to infect our organizations. Our, our own personal patterns and neuroses tends to leak out and kind of uh, muddy the waters of our own organization, though we don't want to. So for those two reasons, we, it's incumbent on us if we're serious about making lasting change and meaningful change, we have to address the internal stuff, the internal inscape, uh, if you will, you were talking about environment, Environment, <laughs> very nice phrase. So we're gonna just share, there are many, many tools, and many, we could probably, if we had time, if we had days here, we could share what you've all used. We're gonna share two that we've used in our lives. We've been partners for, we've been married for, been together for 44 years. <laughs> we're also work partners at Youth Build. We work at, use an international organization. And that, but that's not why we're here to talk about the work. We're talking about the two tools that have that have really sustained us, why, as Jamil says, uh, why we can still do it at our age and still have hope and resilience and uh, happiness that, that we can uh, pass on. So Dorothy's gonna take us to one, then I'll come back and do uh, the second one. Okay, thank you. <laughs> In 1972, John and I were introduced by friends of mine in college to what I'm gonna share with you, which is the, the theory and practice of co-counseling. Have any of you ever heard of it? No. Normally you haven't, because the only way people learn about it is from someone they know well sharing it with them because nobody's making any money from it, but it's been in existence for over 50 years and in about 60 countries and millions of people have taught each other how to support each other through a healing process which enables them to recover their best intelligence and their best uh, emotional well-being. So I'm gonna share with you the basic theory and practice, starting from this, that we are all, here's the good news, we are all born brilliant, good, inherently good, with a great deal of joy and readiness to learn, and we're ready for life, inherently good. And the bad news is that right away we begin to get hurt in different ways, right? Wonderful things happen, but terrible things happen, little and big. Now, the good news is that we're born with an ability to process whatever happens to us, right? You know, we have the gift of tears and of speech and of, you know, cuddling and of laughing and of sharing. Uh, whatever happens to us, we, are, we have the ability to talk it through, to cry it through, to share it, and to recover from it. The bad news is that in most cultures, that healing process which we're born with is suppressed, especially for men, right? Grow up, face it, take it, be a man, be strong, don't cry, Everything's okay, everything's okay, everything's okay. We get shaken, right, if we're trying to process something. If we, uh, but you've seen it a million times, you know. If a child gets hurt, they automatically begin to cry. And they run to their closest person, and they want to be held, and they want to cry more, and they want to cry more. And if they're allowed to cry as long as they need to, then they get up and they go about their business, and they're fine. It's over, right? But if they're not, they carry with them a little weight, right? They're not done yet, they're whimpering, you know, et cetera. Uh, so because most of us, some of the time, are prevented from actually healing from either the little hurts that happen 
or the big societal hurts which come at us every single minute, we it gets internalized in various ways. So there's two kinds of patterns that we say are created through these processes. One is an intermittent pattern which pops up whenever we run into a situation which is very similar to a specific situation that we faced in the past that we didn't heal from, uh, and then those feelings come up again, right? So if we were, you know, bitten by an angry dog, a big German shepherd, you know, bit us, we were three, uh, and we didn't heal from that, chances are we carry a little fear of big German shepherds running toward us. Uh, if, and so that becomes an intermittent pattern. You're not afraid of German shepherds in this room because there are none, right? So you don't carry a constant fear of German shepherd because one only bit you once, but if one came in here, you might have more fear than somebody else. Called an intermittent pattern. And then there are the chronic patterns, the ones that are internalized because you get messages or hurts coming at you either very consistently. So maybe, you know, your father is the one who thinks that you're not worth much if you're not the best at everything you do. And so every day in every way you get the message that you better be the best. Uh, and you internalize that. And, it, and it, after a certain while, it's like it's a little, a key that's always in on position, right? Or maybe you were born black in America and you get the message every single day uh, that uh, you should stay in your place. This is the old message, right? And that you're less than in some way. And you internalize that. And if you feel, and then you also internalize a sense of powerlessness to change it. And so then there's a chronic pattern of how do I relate to the world because I'm black in America. Um, here's the good news. The good news is that no matter how old we are, no matter how rooted these particular intermittent or chronic patterns are, we can still heal from them. We can still recover our complete joy, our sense of power, uh, and our happiness with, if we recover the healing process. And the healing process is pretty straightforward. Because it turns out that we're all carrying, even while we're carrying old hurts and current hurts and the heartbreak that John is talking about, even though we're carrying it, uh, most of us are pretty ready to dump it if someone would give us permission. And if someone would listen to us with a non-judgmental, completely open, caring, empathetic, I support you in this healing process attitude. Um, Typically, that's not how social situations are set up. But you do notice that in our ordinary conversations with other people, we sort of approach the little things, right? So I might be saying to Jamil, I, I might see that German Shepherd, and I, I might say, man, when I was little, I, was, I saw a German Shepherd, German Shepherd started to bite me. And then Jamil, before I've finished, will say, yeah, me too, except for me, it was just a little uh, Labrador retriever. And then you know, we don't give each other the space to actually go through the process of what it would take to heal because everyone is so eager to exchange our own uh, experiences. And so most conversations take place where we're quickly sharing what was similar about our experiences or different, but we don't do the healing. What we do in this co-counseling process is we create two things. We create space where people listen to each other at whatever length of time they agree to, and they exchange time listening to each other. Uh, so there's space, this caring attention that welcomes the emotion, and there's also skill in how to welcome the emotion and how to help people contradict the patterns that are more complicated for them. Uh, obviously, in this, in this session, we're not going to develop the skill, but the fundamental uh, uh, conditions that are required for people to begin 
to process the experiences that have happened to them is one of another human being giving them loving, non-judgmental, non-intrusive attention where they welcome whatever you need to say or feel. I think it's still on. Um, without, drum, that's a magician. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. Uh, and we can always do that for each other. Now, uh, John and I have done this for each other for, you know, 40, 40 well, since 1972, 42 years. And it is the answer to the question when people ask me, how come you always have so much energy and how, much you're not, how come you're not burned out is, well, because I know how to dump the heartbreak and I know how to deal with the early hurts in a, in a systematic way with not only John, but with dozens and dozens of friends who know how to do the co-counseling process. And it really does make a difference. Now, part, to go back to a little bit more of the, of the theory, this is really a theory of intelligence because those of us who are, uh, we know ourselves well enough to know that we make the same mistakes over and over again, don't we? Right? There's some place where our brain goes off and we act in a more automatic way and we say, damn, I did that again. You know, I should have known better than to do that again. And yet it happens sort of automatically when the conditions remind us of the early conditions or, or we stay in a pattern of, uh, of whatever it is, of powerlessness, of timidity, of self-deprecation, of fear, of overexertion, of arrogance, of you know, doing whatever. You know? And we know we have patterns, right? Uh, and it's because we didn't process the original experiences enough to get free enough of them to be able to think clearly about what's happening in the present. This is not the same as that. This, isn't, this present situation is not exactly like what I experienced when I was younger, and therefore I don't have to react automatically in a way that is geared for the past instead of for the present. So if we recover our full intelligence and free it from the, cumulative, the accumulated hurts, we act much more intelligently with uh, much less burden of, of uh, past. Uh, so, uh, so that's the good news, that we have the ability to recover that, and we have the ability to recover and reemerge from old hurts and patterns and think intelligently in the present. Any, any questions or comments at this point? Okay, so I'm going to ask you, uh, to think, go back to the thing about intermittent patterns. Uh, something that you know triggers uh, unusual emotion for you or inhibits you in unusual ways whenever something similar to that happens. Um, and just turn to the person next to you and see if, you, if any intermittent patterns occurred to you that affect yourself and just exchange your thoughts for a minute. This is not the deep listening yet. This is just sharing what occurred to you in this conversation. <laughs> uh, did anyone share something about a pattern which would, you'd like to share with the group? As a consultant, I see this all the time. People that overrepresent their skills drives me up the wall. Because inherently, this is the best of people that really do have the skills. <laughs> so that, that is right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any others? Yes? That's a bit more visceral. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just darkness. I'm just afraid of the dark if I'm alone. Mm -hmm. Just always have been. I feel like a child every time I'm in the dark, mm -hmm. and I think that's it's not unusual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if it's not unusual, <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, it may it may be specific. The fact that you feel that yeah. is your own experience, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. yeah. What sometimes hit me is uh, when injustice is done to people and I shared with my neighbor that all of a sudden I realized when I was a very young child 
I was locked up by my parents in my room because I did something that they didn't like and I was not allowed to explain myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the feeling of being there in mm -hmm. your room, your safety security <coughs> was locked, mm -hmm. made me so angry. Mm -hmm. And I see that connection now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Good examples. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now I'm going to move to something different, uh, just aware of our time limitations. And that is, uh, obviously things occurred to people in this very short time. You probably had two minutes each. I'm going to move to the way co-counseling is practiced. And that is, as I said before, through people listening to each other in depth, non-judgmental, paying full attention uh, with really looking at each other's eyes, whether the other person is looking at you or not. You're not looking out the window. You're not looking at your watch. You're not you know, trying to see what your message is. Um, and we, what we do is we share equal time. So it might, in a normal session, it would be 45 minutes each, for example. So John would listen to me for 45 minutes each. I might rage and cry about the injustices in the world about, or about the stupid thing I did the day before, whatever. Uh, and then we switch. And we switch at an at a agreed upon time in advance because the truth is we could all talk, we could all heal for an unlimited amount of time. So the only thing that makes sense is to sh exchange time with each other in a way that is exactly equal because we're equally important and we all have this extensive uh, potential. Now, one of the things, uh, go ahead, is that a question? question? Yeah. When you read about, just, I don't know what your opinion is on this, but a male versus a female brain and how you process emotions and how you process, well, whether it's a hormone base or not. Mm -hmm. People will often say that women process things better if they can talk it out, and often men don't want to hear it. Or just as an example of something that's kind of societally accepted. It's, I think it's mostly societally accepted, right? It took John two years in co-counseling before he would cry. It took me two minutes, right? right? <laughs> <laughs> now he cries every two minutes and gets great joy out of the fact that he <laughs> But we have been conditioned to accept certain things. And, and why do you think women live longer than men? I believe it's because we're allowed to heal so much of our pain, so much more than men you know, who get the heart attacks. Now that now we have women's liberation, women are getting more heart attacks because we haven't figured out how to do the healing and how to handle the stress. Uh, but you know, I think it's, uh, but the interesting thing about processing part of this theory is that when you have an experience that's painful and you're not allowed to process it, it stays stuck in your brain as a memory that has not been sorted out and not had been stored in the way that most memories are so that it's sitting there and when something similar comes in, it, as you said, triggers it, right? It's a trigger and, it, and that stuff is sitting there and a new experience comes in, reminds you of it and it goes <coughs> um, and until you've healed it, it's still sitting there. And the more times that happens again, the bigger this little space gets uh, in your brain. So that sometimes you meet older people who it's like almost everything triggers it, right? Because <laughs> it's gotten, gotten big. So, and it, that's been sort of confirmed in recent times that, that actually if we don't process our experiences, they, they stay stuck in your brain. I, 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 that was interesting to me that it's actually been demonstrated. So here's what we're going to do. Um, you're going to take four minutes each, just four minutes. You're going to turn to each other in pairs and you can be, you know, take the same pairs if you want to and just share your life story from whatever point of view you want. Four minutes isn't very long, but you'll be surprised. Whatever you feel you've overcome, whatever you feel you haven't overcome, whatever it would be useful for you to overcome, and the other person will listen deeply, will, won't ask you questions, will not be judgmental, and will 
uh, be there for you, and then you will switch sides uh, at the time when we ring the bell, okay? And you'll just experience a little bit of what it is to listen to each other and be listened to. Um, okay? Pair up and start. Not a bad way to spend eight minutes, right? Right. Uh, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, that's a teeny tiny little just taste of exchanging attention. Uh, if any of you are interested in actually learning more about the international network and the deeper and how you actually get training on a deep level in how to do co-counseling uh, in a way that is useful for a lifelong process, you can get in touch with me afterwards and we'll connect you with people in your location who, who teach co-counseling. And now I'm going to turn it over, back over to John uh, f to take us back to mindfulness. Unrelated, but parallel no, processes. No, very, very related. <laughs> so one story is a transition. Hmm, I was living in New York City, uh, walking on the Upper West Side, on Broadway by 112th Street. Summer day, a boy comes by riding a bicycle. He had shorts on. Ten yards ahead of me, he fell off his bike and skinned his knee. And you know how I could start to see the little blood start to come up. But he was a boy, right? So he's going like this. And so I went over to him and I said, I just knelt down. I said, that must really hurt. And he said, yeah, it really hurts. You know? <laughs> he looked up at me like, who is this guy? <laughs> and every time he stopped, I would say, that must still hurt. Yeah, it really hurts. And each time he stopped, I just kept saying, that must still hurt. <laughs> and then he kept looking at me. And here I was just a human being seeing a human in, in distress, stopped in my busy way. And you know what he did then? He began to show me the other scars, to tell, <laughs> tell me the stories about all the times he got hurt. And he did this for about 20 minutes. <laughs> and then he got on his bike and happily rode away. And I thought, wow, just think how many scars we're all carrying. Not just emotional, uh, physical scars, but emotional scars, that we never had a chance to tell anybody that story. There was nobody there to listen. So this process that we use is simply learning how to really listen to each other, really pay attention. And human beings are all around us in deep distress much of the time. We try to, and so, <laughs> but there isn't always somebody to listen. So in addition to this, Dorothy and I got into this co-counseling 40 some years ago. I've also found the practice of mindfulness, which is an intrapersonal discipline, very, very useful and sustaining. And I want to read you a quote that maybe, it's by an unknown person, I don't know who wrote this, but where are my glasses? <laughs> are they just ordinary reading glasses? <laughs> but I have to put them on. See them. If you can sit quietly after difficult news, if in financial downturns you remain perfectly calm, if you can see your neighbors travel to fantastic places without a twinge of jealousy, <laughs> if you can eat happily whatever is put on your plate and fall asleep after a day of running around without a drink or a pill, if you can always find contentment just where you are, you are probably a dog. <laughs> but as I was reading that, didn't you sort of like, oh, yeah, gee, I wish I could, yeah, right, right? Uh, but we come from busy lives, most of us who lived in the West or doing this kind of work. We're often tired, we're rushing, we're using people to accomplish goals rather than being present to the person, right? Our minds are all over the place. We try to be quiet and, you know, sometimes it's like this. <laughs> you, you might never ever feel like that. <laughs> oh, it's just my mind, <laughs> right? So. 
the meditation process, how many of you have meditated before? <laughs> actually, actually, all hands should be up. Because meditation, the state of meditation, is being absorbed in the present moment. Not thinking about the past or the future. And all of us have been there many, many times in our lives. But sometimes they, they go by so quickly we're not even aware of them. So the practice of meditation starts with slowing down. Uh, the mind is a beautiful thing. It's created everything we see around us. It's brought us all here together. It's an, the, we use our mind so beautifully in our work. The mind is a beautiful instrument. But it also has its patterns that keeps us restless. Some, some people talk about, you know, you have a glass of water, muddy water, and if you're just shaking it all the time and it's agitated, it's very muddy. But if you just let it sit, what happens? All that sediment goes to the bottom and you can actually see the clearness. And our minds have the capacity of being clear when they're not agitated. But the mind is, the nature of the mind, you know, uh, Eastern teachers oftentimes talk about monkey mind, right? It's jumping all over the place. It's very hard to control. If you sit, we'll sit in a minute. We'll do a, some, some practice meditation. You've probably noticed how the mind is just all over the place. So meditation is training the mind slowly, gently, gradually, like you train a puppy. Come on back. Come on back. You know, you don't beat it. Say, no, come on, over here. Yeah, that's it. Sit here. And it's off again, right? You just keep inviting it back to a central place. The reason, so we're going to try a meditation using the breath. Many of you have probably done this. But the reason that we, that many meditative uh, traditions use the breath, so many, many reasons, but one, it's always with us. So it's an available instrument for focus wherever we are, standing in the supermarket, sitting at a traffic light, you know, sitting before a meal and taking some breaths before you start a meeting, to have some, just, just be aware of the bodies and the in-breath. In Secondly, our minds tend to follow what we pay attention to. If we're paying attention to multimedia and email and videos and we're eating breakfast while talking to our children and feeding the dog and watching TV, our mind's gonna be like that, pretty agitated. If you sit with the breath, Gradually, the breath tends of its own to slow down. And the mind, if you can keep bringing it back to that, tends to slow down. So that agitated, muddy water tends to get clearer. And from clearness and stillness is where deep insight arises. It's not that we don't have good thoughts and creative energy and all that stuff in our sort of agitated, uh, mobile minds. But the deeper insights come from stillness. And so if you can cry and cry and get rid of some of the pain that's there, and then also allow yourself to be still, train the mind to be still, then we have more opportunity to experience insight and depth and really get down to our true nature that way. So let's try. We're just going to do a little. Um, Breath meditation. The nature of the mind is to have thoughts. That's okay. So in this, we're just going to uh, allow yourself to get comfortable. Your back fairly straight, not rigid. Sometimes it's helpful to have the chest, chest out a little bit, not caved in so that the air can circulate more freely. Both feet on the floor is helpful. And first notice, closing your eyes, if you feel comfortable doing that. Notice the body in contact with the chair. Noticing where your hands are. And in this uh, particular 
meditation, it's not trying to achieve anything. It's simply noticing what is right now. You know, if we can take one breath, one full in-breath and one full out-breath, without thinking of the past or worrying about the future, in that moment, we are free. We're free. Now, locate your breath where it's most vivid for you. Maybe at the nostril, maybe in the belly. Either one. And just allow your awareness to follow the breath in. I don't mean to observe it. I mean to be the breath coming in. Feel the breath coming in physically. Notice when it turns and heads back out. It may stop for a split second before it turns again and comes back in. There's no decisions to be made here, nothing to do. No phones to answer. It's very restful to be in the moment. You might want to anchor the mind by saying in and out silently. When the mind wanders, as it will, gently bring it back to feeling the breath. Many times as you have to, it's okay. Noticing how it is for you right now. Accepting whatever it is right now.
Breathing in, I'm aware of my body. Breathing out, I smile to my body. You might try a half smile on the lips. Back to the breath. So I'd like to invite any of you who wish to share what your experience was doing that, not what you thought about the experience, but what your actual experience was. I almost, I almost got a good bad. I found myself falling asleep. Falling asleep? I think I was too relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> or very tired. <laughs> So sometimes we come from our busy lives and we need to sleep. Um, that's the first thing you become aware of is weariness. Oh my God. Oh, and just waves of weariness. That's okay. Just sometimes feel those waves of weariness. Sleep is not a bad thing. Most of us are underslept. We have to work harder to save the world. Some version of that. No time to rest. Mm. I, I found that uh, I was pretty obvious that my mind worried. <laughs> so I just you kept that. going to it? I just kept going to it. <laughs> 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 but yeah, you know, if, if I wanted to know what those 15 worries I should probably. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and our minds are pretty compulsive. I mean, you know, I remember going to a 10-day retreat, meditation retreat. I have a planning mind, compulsive planning mind. And I would be sitting there saying, I'd be at the meal. It was all in silence for 10 days. I'd be saying, which, which one do I want to eat next? You know, what bite of food do I want to eat? And just that level of, instead of saying, ah, let it go. So just the practice of noticing and then bringing your ba mind back to a center point, like the breath, can be very instructive, <coughs> very helpful. It's just training, but not, oh, can't even meditate right, you know? <laughs> that doesn't, that's part of the pattern thing that Dorothy was telling about. Yes? Um, I find my mind to be like a movie and I just kept replaying what had just happened and what had happened before that. And 
you know, so there's, there's like little film clips of things that happened during the day, just actually just today so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and well, I couldn't bring it back to the birth. I was just too engrossed in it. I couldn't let it go. And that's a choice. We can do that. You know, we can get lost in fantasies and memories and plans. The, it's endless what we can get lost in, right? Uh, but that's the choice we're making. So the choice of meditation offers us is to interrupt that for the time being. Not that it's bad, but if it's compulsive, then it's not healthy. If we don't have control of where our attention goes, right? Yes? And for me, it's, it's lightness. Lightness. Having come out of it and even towards the end of it, I can really feel my breath much slower than it does. Mm -hmm. We all have different experience and we're all just, it'll be different next time you do it, you know. That's the nice thing. How many of you, <clears throat> our, t our minds t tend, left to their own, tend to go either to the past or to the future? How many of you went to the past, remembering things? Okay. How many of you went to the future? Okay. Now, so see right here. If we're, if we're going to the past or the future, one of the things, one of the clues for me is, and I, and I go to the future mostly, it means that I'm not feeling safe in the moment. And when I've been sitting with this very, very deeply, of course, when I was a boy, it wasn't safe to be really who I was in the moment in my particular household because it was a little crazy. So I got busy making plans, making projects, and I'm very good at it. But it's quite compulsive. And I need to, what I need to do partly is heal that old stuff and sitting with that, or I mean, two ways. I'm talking about the internal process of just letting it arise and looking at it. And, and then the other, what Dorothy was talking about, is getting with somebody and talking about it. Both things are quite complementary, really work well for for us. So, I, here's a little uh, acronym that might be helpful. I'd say that the path to liber the point of liberation, the point of meditation is liberation. It's liberation from fear, hatred, ill will, self-judgment, blaming others, anger. All of us are plagued by it to one degree or other. And it's freedom, liberation to love, uh, be more in touch with who, our true nature, to let com our natural compassion uh, flow out, our generosity and altruism, all those are deep parts of us too. Sometimes covered up by the patterns and the old hurts that we got. And so liberation by letting ourselves feel the feelings and heal those things or liberation by stepping back in meditation realizing, well, I'm not, I'm not only my feelings. I'm not only my body. I'm not only my perceptions. I'm not only my, my sensations. I'm not only my roles. I'm not only this, the, the, my, the things in life. It's a very helpful process. So I say that the path to liberation is SWEET, S-W-E-E-T, and it stands for this. The S part is slow down and finally stop. That's the first thing to do, slow down and stop. Not all the time, of course. A lot of things we have to do very quickly. <laughs> But to allow ourselves time to do this sweet process. Slow down and stop. I try to have, uh, I eat my lunches by myself. I try to turn my computer to blank screen and I don't have a meal with anyone else and I try to eat slowly and experience the food I'm eating. I made a really good sandwich this morning. I wanna know I'm eating that sandwich. Sometimes I go to the men's room uh, at work, and I, I walk slowly down the hallway. Just to remember that I'm in a body. 
So you can do this in your ordinary lives. Uh, before the phone rings, I don't know what's going to come over the phone. So I, I let it ring three times. I try to breathe to kind of be ready for what's going to come at me. Maybe happiness, maybe sorrow. Somebody may have gotten shot in youth build. I want to be more present for it rather than being distracted. Hello? Oh, yeah, just a minute. I want to be fully more present for it as I can. Can't always do it. So slow down and stop is the first one. The W stands for, I have two words for each of these things. The W is witness, that is, notice what's actually happening in the moment. Witness and welcome. Is it a, a mean-spirited thought that's there? Okay. Right now I'm having a mean-spirited thought. <laughs> We all have them. It's not the, my basic nature, but I do have them. Let that go through. That's not who I am, but I have mean-spirited thoughts, jealous <coughs> thoughts, self-put-down thoughts. That's okay. And welcome them. Ah. My teacher says, well, I'll get to that. My teacher is a Vietnamese Zen master, Thich Nhat Hanh, and uh, he came through the Vietnam War and knows suffering at that level build the whole organization. So the E, there are two E's. So the next one, so we slowed down, stopped as much as possible our normal activity. We notice, we witness and welcome whatever experiences, sensations, thoughts are coming through. The two E's are embrace. So my, my teacher says uh, fear is there. You say, you hold fear like a little baby or anger. Hi, fear. I know you. <laughs> Hi, there's my anger again. I, I, you've been around quite a bit lately, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll take care of you. You don't have to act out and scream. I know, it, but I'm feeling, feeling it. But I just, you know, embrace it. And then the other is explore. Okay, okay, anger. What are the roots of that anger? Why is she making me so mad? It's not her, it's something else that's happened. That that's triggering. So embracing it first instead of pushing it away. I shouldn't be feeling anger or either acting out on it. And then exploring the roots of that. And then the T is the transformation of the suffering. So anger, I've embraced, I've explored the roots. Maybe I silently have cried to myself. Maybe I've gone to Dorothy and had a co-counseling session about what makes me so angry about this situation. I cry and, and get some of the anger out. And then that transforms the anger into an energy that I can use without hurting and adding more suffering. Because I don't want, you know, in my role as leader, I don't want to add more suffering in the world. None of us do, right? Transform and transcend that whole situation. So it's very sweet. <laughs> Let's just sit for one minute to end. I know we're at the end. And there's, these are very, very tiny little experiences of these two processes, and there are lots more in the world. But let's just enjoy hearing three sounds of the bell. And the bell itself, you know, it's to make a relationship with the bell, being present at the bell. And I do a little wake, what's it called, a wake up. Like I, I say that gives the bell a signal that something's about to happen. It gives all of us a signal that we're about to invite a fuller sound. And just close your eyes and enjoy the sound of the bell. And taking three deep breaths. Between each one.
And in my tradition, we end a meditation practice by forming our hands in, in the, a lotus. This is a lotus. It's not a prayer position. It's a, a lotus flower. And we bow to each other and we, we say, I'll say it, and you may want to repeat after me. May the fruit of our practice benefit all beings and the earth. Can I try that? May the fruit of our practice benefit all beings and the earth. And we bow to each other. Thank you very much. There is a meditation room now that we have finally gotten at the Skull World Forum. It's in the west wing around the corner, outside and around the corner, from 8.30 to 9.30 every morning, uh, tomorrow and, and Friday morning, in room 12 on the second floor, in case you'd like to uh, partake. Are you leading one, Bart? Well, I can join you. I will join, but uh, I can Yeah, I'm not doing it, but, but yeah. Bart's, a, Bart's also a Dharma teacher like myself. And, so. <laughs>